I'm ready. Okay. Hey folks, hope you're all doing good. Uh, I just got back, me and Mike made a big circle. It was a sequel to Grumpy Old Men, but we got her done. It went about 3,000 miles. Now the subject today is collection. And it's a pretty big deal because what I've learned this year, and I'll blame it on COVID and China, but there's been a real epiphany for me about the reasons why people come to my clinic and what they bring when they do come. So while I'm babbling, I'm gonna work on collection on this horse. And for me, the best way for me to get it in a hackamore is walking backwards. So I wanna start off by saying that there's a, I wanna give you the list of type of riders that come to my clinics. And um, the things that I've seen come through the gate. And please bear in mind, the people that come to my clinics are trail riders that want to get better and cowboys that need to doctor by themselves, is what I, what I believe. Okay, so I've seen bitless bridles, loping halters, twisted snaffle, snaffle, correction bit, martingales, tie down, shank bit, which is a snaffle, which we call a nutcracker, and a mechanical hackamore actually showed up. I haven't seen one for years. And of course we call those mechanical crackamores. But anyway, th all the above that I just mentioned have nothing to do with collection. Now, collection is a discipline. It's a style of riding. I'm, I'm having to say that because there's other disciplines in Western riding that don't utilize collection at all. And there again, you know, I'm not Billy Graham, so I'm not going to preach about it. I'm just saying what I teach is the California style of riding, which has to do with collection and self-carriage. So with the bits and headgear that I just mentioned, it's pretty much really hard for somebody to get collection with those kind of, that kind of gear because it's not designed like what the Hackamore is. And what, I, what, I, what I'm doing with Chinaco, and this is year four, to get collection, he has to break here, here, and the nose. I don't want him lower than my swell of my saddle, the fork, and I don't want him behind the hackamore. So if you watch it, you'll see where I'm headed, and this is what I call collection. Now, I, I got to be with Meg, who is a high-end three-day eventer in Granbury, Texas, and her and I had a short visit, because one thing about her, it doesn't take long. You, you ask her a question, she gives you an answer. I like that. Anyway, I, I asked her, I said, to you personally, is it, a, is it an insult when people use the term cowboy dressage? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, well, good, then we, we agree on that. Because the main reason I say that is because if you watch, this is how I get collection on a horse. Whether it's Janaco or a 12-year-old, when I ride them in the clinic, I always back them up. And that helps them break. And for me, that's how I put collection on. All right, collection, as far as I'm concerned, in the flat saddle world, is driving the hindquarters up underneath the horse and then bringing the skull back so that they go into a frame. Now, Deb, is that practical to you, what I just said? Yes, I would agree with that statement. Okay, Mayor, yes or no? Okay, so Mayor, who has 30 years of experience riding, has an opinion, and I really respect her opinion. And of course, Deb has ridden both flat saddle and western. So we have a, an amazing opinion every morning about everything. There. So what you're seeing is the beginning of collection. Now I'm going to do it walking forward, and you'll see why at year four, he's just now gonna start to get it. Now the reason I'm saying just now starting to get it is because he's got a really long stride, which I am very happy with, because I ride outside and I want him to have a long stride. There is no collection involved in a long stride for me. When I pick up the rein, that's when he gets into collection because it means I'm about to work a gate, stop, 
do something that has to do with the feet moving in a different direction than a big long reach. So I will never kill the big long stretchy fast walking horse. So now I walk forward. You're watching the beginning of collection and self carriage backwards. Now forward, I have to bump the horse into it because his automatic response is to walk really fast, which I've let him do for two years or a year, or whatever, a year, yeah. So there's your start. Okay, if you'll notice, his feet aren't real accurate because he's like, do you want to go or stop? What is it? So all I'm doing is starting a conversation with this horse to explain to him that he can walk forward in collection. There again, he's four. Well, I work by the month and I don't have to be anywhere. Now, he gets to process what I just did. So I guess what my point is, is that with all the headgear that I see, very little of it has to do with collection or self-carriage. Yes. Well, around the breakfast table this morning, you mentioned that, okay, so in the English world, dressage, uh, hunters, whatever, collection begins with the hind and being pushed into the hands. Whereas with you, you want to deal with collection and work from the balance of the horse down through the feet. So that's kind of the other direction. I approach the same thing a different way, as in walking backwards. Right, and eventually collection comes out the feet instead of right. coming out the well, head. The frame of the horse frames up and then the horse gets soft walking backwards. Walking forward, it hasn't come out the feet yet. Got it. And it will this year. Right. Year, not week. <sighs> okay. In Western riding, what I've noticed is that there's three styles of riding Western, from what I've, four, excuse me. The first one, and you all know how I feel, but I'll go there anyway, is the show horse. All right, show horses are shown for ribbons and whatever reason they do it and they just have a ball so now lately they have what they call the ranch riding class which is another class added and i think that it i watched it on the thing while i the chewed YouTube. on my arm <laughs> and it in fact is a fun little event that people get to do and it's cross between trail riding and something but in the typical show ring the horse's head is down and typically behind the bit. And we've all talked about this for years. We call them peanut rollers. There's all kinds of comments. So the AQHA, as far as the California style, which I do, the AQHA stands for the Amarillo Quarter Horse Association. Because the good old boys in Amarillo behind the doors decide how the judges are gonna judge and they get together and figure out these events. But one of the things that happened was that as I watched one of the instructors explain the rules and the wannabes or whatever the particulars are in this event, is that they've gotten away from the fancy silver saddles and a whole lot of bling and the shirts that look like they're on fire. And they've tried to get more down to earth. Well, in the California tradition, we have silver. We're proud of it. It's part of our culture. Silver bits, silver spurs. We don't go overboard like some of you see in the show ring, but the fact is it's part of our tradition. Now, in Amarillo, it's not part of the tradition. It, I've already been there. It's two different cultures. And there's nothing wrong with either one. So that's the show world with the head down and behind the bit, for me personally, is impossible to get self-carriage or what I consider collection of the horse breaking at the withers. And so what happened to me in one of the clinics this year is people showed up that did the ranch riding or ranch. There's several buzzwords on the end of the word ranch. Ranch horse classes. Okay, well, okay. But the fact is their horse's heads were down and the horses were over on the forehand. And so it was hard for me to explain how I teach collection and self-carriage and it was discouraging for them. And they wanted a foundation. And I'm saying, well, here's the foundation. And I backed the horses up and tried to get them to raise their heads. Well, those of you that are in the know know that when you bump a horse, 
the way trainers do it now, it teaches them to lower their head. So I'm kind of up against it when I'm in this clinic. So, and I told the ladies in it, I said, now three weeks from now, you're gonna enter one of these classes and you're gonna put their head down. So what's the point of wanting to learn collection? It's either or, a horse doesn't get that. And I'm not, well, I guess I'm venting, but the point is, if you're a dyed in the wool and believe that your horse's head should be down on the forehand, then there's not a whole lot of point in coming to a clinic with me. One of the ladies loaded up and waved to me with one finger and left because she was mad because I told her, my dear, you're going to have to learn to ride better. Imagine that. So anyway, that's the story on the show world. Now on the trail, the typical horse that comes in the clinic which doesn't go home that way is the hollow back and the nose out. And a lot of people in their defense, they honestly come because they don't know better. And they'll tell me, I came here to learn because how do you know what you don't know and all the other sayings. So I in fact show them how they can take that trail horse and get it in some level of collection. And why? Because your horse's feet are more accurate. Well on the trail, riding like most people do, and especially when I noticed in Ohio, there's these wild vines growing through the woods and they get hung up in them. There's all kinds of problems. So if you're mounted pretty good and your horse is in collection, you're gonna be able to handle problems better than if he's rooting his nose against a bit and hollow backed and only listening to your hands. It only gets worse. It only gets worse because a human is only so strong. A horse, his tongue's stronger than most people's arms. So that's the kind of humans or people that bring their horses that I really enjoy because we can actually accomplish something because they're not out for a ribbon, they're just out to live through the ride. So that helps. And now the cowboys that come, I can tell when they come in the clinic, you know, they're, they want to get better because they entered the clinic. Okay, I have roping clinics that teach all that doctrine stuff, but also they find out after a roping clinic that you probably need horsemanship prior to doing the style of roping I do. And I'll, I'll keep it simple on the style. It means doctrine by yourself. So to my way of thinking, the way I work cattle in an alley, loading semis, branding, whatever I have to do with cattle, I need a horse in collection so that I can work cattle as subtle and quiet as I possibly can in the corral with my horse in my hand. And oh, by the way, when they're in the bridle, they're on loose rein because you're staying out of their way so they can work the cattle. And what I've noticed in a lot of ranch horses is that none of them disengage their hindquarter. And I use disengaging the hindquarter a lot working cattle because of calves and cows. So I just use my horse as a gate and put the hinge on the head and swing the hindquarter over to the alley. All right, then I might bring the forehand across to work and our side pass and shut the alley off. And if I don't have a higher level of collection, I can't get any of this done. Okay, now here's the story on riding as far as I'm concerned. I just said I can't get anything done. Well, I can't get anything done unless I have collection because that's my discipline. That's what I believe in. All right, now you head east of here and you run into the neck rein ranch horse. Please understand, I, wrote, I read the book by Michener about Texas, and I get it. And I'm just using Texas because it's a really big state and there's a hell of a bunch of cowboys. They have a flat horse and it neck reins and it works just fine. That's what they do. Okay, that's over. I don't go to their clinic and say I want to learn to be flat and neck rein. If a man comes to me that's a cowboy and says I want to get collection going on my horse, we're entered up and he's intelligent enough to know it's not an argument or a, or a thing about geography. It's just a fact of how you want to do things. Well, I dally and I want collection. Neck rein horse, tie off hard, neck rein. It all comes down to loading a truck. How much shrink did you put on those cattle? How noisy was it? How many people did it take to load that truck? That's the way I look at it. That's the national finals in the ranch horse world. Okay, so Chinaco, 
this year you will watch collection come into play and bear in mind that all this last year I wasn't focused on collection because I knew that with me bumping him 10,000 times because you don't pull with both hands he was going to form himself into a level of collection and as soon as he gets it through his mind that he's not an out doing an out big stretchy walk he gets pretty handy okay so now this year I get to slow him down and get a more disciplined ride he's been outside he'll go right up a power pole if I ask him so I got that taken care of I'm doing the outside country feeling good thing and then coming back to the the fine stuff so what I want to show you is that when I ask I start to get a level of collection in my horse and I can feel him on the hind quarter so later on when I get ready to go to work and I pick up my reins he's going to collect himself and say what do you need see what he's doing all right that's him finding that center now just for the sake of knowing in the California style when I actually hang a bit on him the way the bit is designed and the weight of the bit he's going to seek collection by balancing the bit in his mouth so when it is in fact balanced because of all the angles and the weight he will be in self carriage so in the back of my mind they're like I got this covered horse you don't even know it because you've never had a bit in your mouth but when this comes down to the end you're gonna hang that bit and carry it for a year and you're gonna be carrying yourself in self carriage it's not a cop-out it's a fact so now I'm gonna get sticks he's 10 years old and I've known him pretty much his whole career got him as a horse out of the exercise track never went to the racetrack and off and on over the years I've been able to work with him and then Mayor and I are both riding him and anyway I want to show you what collection looks like in a western bit so Deb before I quit babbling on this horse is there anything I missed oh uh, were you gonna go over the the thinking horses light oh yeah that's right I get a lot of emails and it says my horse is light as a feather okay there's a difference between light as a feather and collection I will show you what light as a feather means this is what a light looks like when you ride light how light can you be this is how like people it's mainly in a snaffle this is what they'll do with their fingers okay that's how light the horse is they're going for lightness but if you'll notice he's not in collection he is turning and that's true and that's without me using my leg so that's lightness and then it's oh my god look how light he is okay that to me is not collection that's simply a horse that's hollow in the back flat necked and you're in an arena and you're not really putting any pressure on him so when it comes to tipping a cow over outside which I'm sure all of you have to do the light thing kind of goes out the window okay and the one other subject I think has to be mentioned and it just came to my mind is we pick horses based on the way they're built so if you want one of those modern quarter horses that's three inches shorter in the front than the hind you're working against gravity to attain collection that's right and this horse was born in collection he just doesn't know it and a thoroughbred an Arab a lot of appendix horses like she said we watch the horses and we can tell you can do it it's just going to be a lot harder well we've done it with that blue valentine horse it made it yeah and it took a long time for her to get that horse up but she did it cammy did it up in, in janesville so yes that's a very good point point. The, and a, a downhill quarter horse is exactly what you get it's a downhill quarter horse and that's why the curve in the cheeks and that just goes on and on but what happened to me this time was my friend luther had a really nice horse he's a rancher out of Louisiana and we got to ride together in Texas and I watched him ride and what he had was his horse was kind of flat but he was bridling up nice so what it meant was he was breaking at the pole but he wasn't breaking at the withers as much as I wanted to see and he wasn't breaking right here at all 
So in the, in the Santa Barbara, I got him to work the horse and back up until it did that. And as soon as, we, as soon as he felt the neck start to give, then he released. And then by the end of the day, he had the horse bridled up completely, simply by changing his hands. Now please hear me. This is not how you ride the rest of your life. This is schooling. That's all it is. When you get it, you quit doing it. Watch that horse move his head. Now, then you quit doing that and you go back to riding because now the horse breaks at the third vertebrae. And that's part of collection to have a horse's arc in the neck. So he got it done. In April, the lady that was also in the clinic had a big stout Queen Mary quarter horse and she had it in a snaffle and she'd done all her homework and all I had to do was give her that last piece which was a western bridle. Put it on the horse, it broke at the withers and understand now it's two different stories. When I put the western bridle on her great big horse who was a big stout good old school quarter horse type when I picked up on the western bit the length of the cheek piece made the horse break at the withers. The snaffle was a straight line to the corner of the mouth. That's why you don't get collection on an older horse that's been leaning on a snaffle. So you put the western bit on, bam. It was, I don't know, 40 minutes total and the horse was in the bridle, in the western bridle, not a spade, in a half breed and she was able to ride one handed when she left there. And it worked. And she's hand enough to do it and she that's what she came for whether she knew it or not, but that's the way she went home. And it was really, really neat. So, Luther and April, I thank you for a wonderful time riding with you. So, let me get another horse. Well, this is our bunkhouse. It's still a work in progress. Our friend Chris has done some excellent work on our windows. So that's the actual room gonna be really cool. This is gonna be the kitchen area, bathroom, shower. And then we come over here. We've got a really cool tack room area. Bunch of junk. So this is more handiwork of Chris. We have a mare height sink, meaning our friend mare. And then the next section is going to be hay. Then there's a little space that's going to turn into a corral, an extra corral. And of course, a handy gate. And um, our house is over there. And here's the view. So it will be a room with a view. Be open for business hopefully soon. All right, darling, I gave him the tour. Okay, folks, you guys all know Sticks. He's the family horse, we call him. And, uh, He's 10 now and he's settled, meaning I can rope a calf, I can, anything I want to do, I can do on him and he's like so. And uh, any one of us can ride him and he's he's 10 years old, so we're pretty happy about that. And um, I put the Ramal rain on a few months ago because he was ready for it. In other words, I was able to do the logs with the three rules and he was just fine and I didn't need to ride with a flat hand and help him anymore. Okay, you all know the story on the coastal range, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But the fact is, just something to remember, a hard thing for people to get used to, is when I'm outside making a circle, I hold him here when I'm trotting out across country. And it's a hard thing for a lot of people to do, but this is how I do it on the coastal rain. So when I rope, I'm here because my hand is up my horse is in collection and I can get to my saddle horn. This is where April was getting in trouble in Texas. She had everything on top of the horn. And then of course she looked at it 
and all we did was laugh at her and she made it through the day but here is when I'm in the corral and I'm working cattle now I have to put him in more collection you see him rock backwards now this is this is where I want him and I keep giving him the rain and he'll take his nose and get it vertical to work a cow so walking backwards he's doing everything I need him to do and the way to the bit he'll level his nose out because I'm not pulling his head behind he's just trying to find that pendulum spot but this is the 10 year old as opposed to a four year old on a loose rein so when I start working a cow and he starts looking at it and I start asking for lateral movement then his head will come up more because he needs to be more balanced and it works for me all horses have a different height of their skull for elevation but the point is I teach collection and self carriage that's the end result for me I don't go to clinics and teach everybody how to make a spade bit horse if anybody's interested I will bend over backwards to help them but 99.9% .9 of the people that come to me just want to ride better and they choose me which I'm very grateful and honored that they choose me to show them how to ride with their skeleton instead of their hands that's the premise all right now I got a little you know I'm not going to talk about the water at the Navajo because that's starting to work but I did get a chance to get an email from some folks on the Nez Pierce so I got a connection to another person that was very knowledgeable about the Nez Pierce and their horses and the two things I found out was that they said that the the thing about the Nez Pierce and the Appaloosa and that's all they bred for and they made them that's a myth they bred all kinds of horses not 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 just for color of spotted horses they had all colors okay there's a horse I'm going to give you a little history here and a connection to think about because the last thing I'll ever do is argue with you is that when we talk about wild horses I've been on this thing about connecting dots all over the world and why we have the horses we have and there's been talk of the line back done with the, the stripes on the legs and I've pursued that and uh, what I found out two things is that the Taki is the name of the wild horse in Mongolia okay that has a connection to the United States of America and rather than bore you to death with the details I'm hoping that the young people especially will get out a book and read it as opposed to asking Mr. Google the second thing is is that in those horses in Mongolia there's a whole bunch of them that are spotted from one end to the other all right the Taki was almost extinct in 1969 but it goes back a thousand years so they were spread all the way across Russia the whole Siberian thing everywhere at one time now we're talking 1800s is when I connect them to the United States and I'll just tell you north of Frisco were a bunch of Russian mountain men that were fur trappers and they need something to carry their furs and their beaver pelts now for you leathernecks I found out that the famous horse in the Korean War the mare named Reckless who had a colt named Fearless incidentally was a Mongolian horse so there you go now I'm going to ride this horse and show you what for me the reason why I do everything I do in the California style and why it's important for me to have collections so that when I actually go in the corral I can be as quiet and as smooth as I possibly can and that's why it's called the dance so this horse who is a straight up thoroughbred I can ask him to walk in collection in a schooling walk moving small calves and then move over to pick up another one and then back to get this one and then oh we forgot one so I need you to walk backwards and I don't have to pull he's very balanced now turning right would be nice so I just happen to see this cow over here so I need to go get it oh let's step back out of the eye get behind the eye and move the cow now we can take it down the alley 
And then if we hear the boards creaking, we would actually back up so we don't tear down these bed spring corrals we're trying to ship out of. The horse is prepared for any gate I want because it's on the hindquarter and ready to move out when I ask. And for me personally, the beauty of collection is that when I'm done and I set the reins down, the horse says so. So what? I'm done. What else do you want to do? That's why, okay? So just bear in mind that collection for me and self-carriage is very special. It's a California style and it's something that I really strive to do. And oh, by the way, that Chinaco is going to be a spade bit horse. This is a half-breed horse now. He'll never be a spade bit horse. And I'm happy with both of them. So I hope this, this helps clear up some myths. And I guess what my point is, is that if you want to get in a clinic with me, I'd love to have you. But if you're a diehard person that believes 100% that you've got to ride in a bitless bridle, then don't get in. There is one other thing, folks, that Mare brought up. She's riding Blondie. And she's found out that when you're going off a steep hill or any kind of tough terrain, you put the horse in collection and they're more accurate with their feet. And that makes sense because like Chinaco, when I'm on flat ground, I pitch him the rain and I want him to reach. But then when I get in the rocks, he needs to pay attention where his feet is. If he had that big, long, stretchy reach and he was flat as a table, he would just be flogging his way through the rocks. So she brought up a very good point. Another reason why trail riders need collection is to be more accurate in the brambles, the, the logs, the rocks. Off a steep hill. Off hills. a steep hill, everything. So. There you go, thank you.